For the past two years, I put my heart and soul into developing my dream game, Mana Valley. When I started, all I had was a vision of friends playing as witches, defending a base. I had no idea how to make the things that would go into this game, but I wanted to bring everyone along for the ride. After nine videos totaling three million views, the game is considered one of the top wishlisted games on Steam. This is Mana Valley. In Mana Valley, you play as a young witch who is starting on their journey to master the elements. The game is primarily focused on progression, meaning you'll get better and stronger the more that you play. Yes, there is a story. Yes, it's open world. And no, the term RPG and open world are not contradictory, no matter what you guys say in the comments. For the first year of development, I explored new ideas and mechanics. The game had enemy AI, flying, an inventory system, saving and loading, and building and farming. At least, so I thought. As Mana Valley grew, so did its complexity. The downsides of visual scripting started to emerge, so I resolved to slowly convert everything to code over time. At about a year and a half, the game engine I'm using decided to set the industry on fire and a core asset I'm using announced an update that would break all current visual scripts. I made a whole video on that, so I won't go into detail, but just to be clear, I updated this asset knowing everything would break. And I know it might sound weird, but breaking everything was actually one of the best decisions for the game. Most people advise solo devs to focus on making small games. With a small project, the end is always close enough that you can force a game over the finish line. That doesn't translate well to larger games. You need to think more about systems. Redoing things was a chance for me to refocus on that. Take something as simple as making your character ignore input while you're in a menu. In a small game, you might only have one menu. When a menu is open, you disable movement. When a menu is closed, you enable it. With multiple menus, you need to check if any of them are open. Otherwise, closing a menu will re-enable movement when another menu is still active. As more and more menus are added, that approach quickly becomes a spiderweb of checks. I was thinking about the problem based on what worked in small games I had done in the past. It took me months of fighting with menus until I finally got fed up and developed a solution where I just keep count when any menu is open or closed. If the count is zero, the player can move. If it's greater than zero, they can't. This required me to develop a system for dealing with menus. But once I had a system, it made it easy to implement the ability to ignore hotkeys when in typing menus and allow pressing escape to exit menus in reverse order. Similarly, for around a year, spells were cast from the center of the camera. This is the most straightforward approach to making sure your projectiles are lined up with where your cursor is aiming. But if you were to view this in third person, it would look really weird. Instead, I decided to just check what the player is aiming at and aim the spell towards that after it's created at the tip of the wand. It's a little weird when objects are super close to the player because you can hit them without realizing, but I think it's an overall net positive. Systems are great and all, and certainly necessary in a project of this size, but working on them doesn't always result in visual progress. The good news, however, is that the work I'm doing prioritizes gameplay. The most fundamental being a way to die and respawn. Dying used to look like this, but now it looks like this. And the player respawns at the closest shrine. I originally had the player drop their items on death, but after playing some games that use that as a solution, decided that it's not actually very fun at all to rescue your stuff when that happens. I have some alternative ideas, but I'd love to hear what you guys think in the comments. To add progression into the game, I implemented a leveling system. With each level, the player gets two skill points and two elemental points to spend. Elemental points determine strengths and weaknesses when dealing and receiving damage. 
In the first year, I implemented building and farming. At the time, building was based on a grid-like system inspired by Minecraft. The downside of this approach is that the terrain doesn't perfectly line up with the grid, so you either can't place something or you have to settle for it floating or clipping. So maybe Minecraft isn't the best solution to reference here. Instead, I implemented a system similar to how Rust and Pow World do it. There are different categories of buildable objects that each have their own rules for how they should be placed and what they should snap to. Foundations only snap to other foundations. Walls snap to foundations, walls, and floors. You get the picture. When something isn't snapping, you can freely rotate it, but when it is, it'll only rotate based on its snap constraints. Right now, I've implemented wood foundations, walls, and ceilings, which means you can make a little house. One consequence of adding building is that players could build structures to avoid enemies. To fix this, buildings can be damaged and enemies will attack them. Of course, you have to be able to unbuild things as well. There was a spell I made the first time I made building, but it had to be redone to work with the new spell system. The winning community vote for the spell's name was Reclaim, so that's what it's called now. Since I redid building, I also had to make some adjustments to farming. Placing seeds ties into the building system. That was fairly easy to implement, but I also changed the way interaction works between years one and two, so you couldn't harvest any crops. My original approach to showing interactable objects was to show an outline. This didn't give the player a lot of precision though. To fix this, I implemented a different system that shows a list of interactable objects around the player and allows them to specifically select what they want to interact with. Right now, it's only been implemented on items, but the same system can also be used in the future with chests and doors. I also use this as an opportunity to improve farming as well. Now there's a tick manager that checks a few plants every frame instead of every plant checking every frame. Each plant now also references in-game time. Scrubbing through time gives us the ability to evolve or devolve the stage life. I assume this will be useful when I implement sleeping into the game. The plant hydration system has a few changes too. Instead of showing how thirsty a plant is, the game just shows if a plant is thirsty. Being thirsty stops a plant from growing, and if it's thirsty long enough, it dies. Like before, you can water plants using a watering can and in the future with watering spells. The watering can ties into the new system I developed for handheld items. Functionality for using items in your hand is determined by the item you're holding. I know that sounds like an obvious approach, but I originally only intended for the player to be able to hold wands and cast spells. I came to the realization that doing every action through spells would make it overwhelming to manage and make finding new spells less exciting. Tying the watering can into the system was the first test at trying something that wasn't a wand. So I'm super excited to extend it to fishing rods when I implement fishing in the next month or so. The ticker management system I made for farming was built in a way that I can apply it to resources in the near future. I'm confident that resource harvesting will really fill out the game loop. Being able to harvest resources to sell at vendors will give players access to buy new items until crafting and alchemy are in the game. The last major thing in that loop would be having chests to store the items that you buy. If you haven't been keeping up with these videos, I previously thought the arena would be a great place to test core mechanics, but after all the rework and recent changes, we're really close to being able to playtest the core game instead of an isolated scene. I think that's a pretty big W. The arena will eventually be accessible via a portal that appears at night. I've been working on making the starting island what's called a vertical slice of the game. After enough testing, this will eventually become the demo. My number one priority right now is to get the game to closed alpha. There's been a lot of progress recently because I decided to stop juggling multiple projects and just focus on Mana Valley. I'm also now working with a YouTube editor, Nathan Online, so it's given me back about a week of development every month that I was losing editing videos. Year three is going to be the most productive year yet. 
Thank you to everyone who supported this project. You're making this possible. And a special thank you to patrons and YouTube members. I'm passionate about this project, but it's much easier to have passion when I know people want to see me finish this. And after two years, I'm finally ready to announce the release date for this game on a